Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. We're in a global pandemic. We're also in a global blood shortage. The more I dug, the more it took me back to the origins of cities. If you can do something, the same thing that, that your ancestors did, that's pretty cool. Today on Spotlight, a new exhibit with an interesting name that explores motherhood and family. Plus, a historian gives us a tour of two dozen cities in one book. And then Mercy's donor program confronts the blood shortage. But first, toasting to Missouri's 200th birthday with a glass of bourbon. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. I like old things. I, I have antiques everywhere. Now that I'm 80, I am one. And I like to save as many things as possible. And I want to preserve whiskey making. The whiskey being made in this 1950s milk barn in the country hills outside Jefferson City, Missouri, will age for months in these barrels before it's ready to drink. But its recipe and story are much older. My family made alcohol all of our lives. The corn whiskey is the recipe that my family made back before Prohibition. That's Mike as a kid next to his dad, Michael Broker Sr., a blacksmith who also ran a sawmill in Frankenstein, Missouri. Like many in those days, Michael Broker and his wife, Anna, made just about everything they consumed. We have heard the stories uh, about uh, Grandpa distilling. Including whiskey, a recipe Mike Jr. jotted down before it was lost to time. I said, I want to get this recorded because my bucket list, I want to make the family recipe one time before I die. A successful one time eventually led to Mike and his children opening a craft distillery named for the family patriarch. I wanted to pay homage to our blacksmith grandfather. Just two years after its opening, the Show Me State is recognizing blacksmith distillery's heritage as part of its 200th birthday celebration. Hey, are you all right? hey, it licensed Blacksmith's whiskey as a bicentennial bourbon, saluting Missouri's long tradition of distilling. It's a part of our history. It's a part of who we are as a state. That's something I've learned during the bicentennial is the history of a lot of these distilleries. And I love learning the family history too and kind of their stories that they have because it's not all about the bourbon. It's about the stories of how they got there and how these bottles came to be and what, what's in them and how they as a family got excited about it and how they started. Missouri has about 30 craft distilleries, many with historic roots, on its Spirits Expedition Trail, a trail just like you would see in Kentucky or Tennessee. But that's not the only thing Missouri now shares with those states when it comes to whiskey. The Missouri legislature passed a law in 2019 for classifying Missouri bourbon whiskey. And the steps distillers have to take to get that Missouri bourbon label are arguably the strictest in the country. It's all made in Missouri. As the components of the bill has, is that all the corn has to be bought from Missouri farmers, and all the white oak barrels need to be bought from Missouri producers. So that's what makes us very unique. No other place has corn and barrel origin requirements, and Representative Jeff Porter, who sponsored the bill, hopes that will set Missouri bourbon apart from its competitors. We have all the components here, so let's just make our own footprint. Let's go forward and show what Missouri distillers can do. It's a recipe that my family made before Prohibition. I won't say whether it made it during Prohibition. <laughs> And we have some great distillery people. They have their own stories, and that's what makes us very unique. And I like the stories of each one. We're, what, two and a half years old now, and having a blast, and love telling our story. For Missouri's craft distillers, and blacksmith distillery in particular, favorite part of the whole process. Right here. I can't stop myself from reading the backstory. We are a fourth generation family 
with roots in Frankenstein, Missouri. Yes, really, Frankenstein. It seems to be a story that has many more chapters to be written. You know, if you can do something, the same thing that, that your ancestors did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that's, that's pretty cool. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For over 6,000 years, human history has been shaped by the rise of cities. British historian Ben Wilson's enlightening and entertaining book, Metropolis, A History of the City, Humankind's Greatest Invention, is a thrilling tour of over two dozen cities and thousands of years of urban innovations, from medieval Baghdad to Belle Epoque Paris and 21st century megacities Lagos and Karachi. In today's interview, Wilson discusses his ode to the world's greatest cities, the challenges they've faced, and how cities drive civilization forward. Wilson is joined in conversation by Robert Lewis, professor of urban planning and development at St. Louis University and director of the Community Planning Lab. Ben, first of all, what's your background and motivation to write Metropolis? Well, I've been um, a historian all my working life, the author of, of, of several books, and it, I kind of got sort of brought to the city and urbanization because a lot of the subjects I studied involved cities, how cities worked. Lately in my career, I became more interested in patterns of global trade and exchange and centered around very dynamic urban environments, particularly I'm thinking about in the 19th century with the growth of big American cities, growth of cities like Shanghai. And so all that research took me to the idea of a global city or the idea of a metropolis that has a kind of almost disproportionate power in its own time and is able to connect across globes, across societies, draw people to it, tell mm -hmm. us bigger pictures, bigger stories about the particular times that they kind of, they, they thrive and flourish in. So I took that as a starting point for, for Metropolis. And the more I dug, the more it took me back to the origins of cities. And I find cities personally fascinating places. And part of me wonders what makes them tick? How do we kind of survive this kind of concrete jungle? Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. looking for things that were specific about cities in their times, but also there's kind of universal stories that those cities, whether it was ancient Rome or ancient Baghdad or London in the 17th century or whatever city it happened to be, what story it told us more widely about urbanization, why we got there, what makes a successful city, why they can be, you know, places of incredible growth and flourishing of ideas. Other times they go into periods of decline. So that's what I wanted to pick out in the book was to tell this story that I think, you know, has its origin 7,000 years ago, but each city in turn that I, I write about has a kind of, um, has a, a general, a universal theme that we can we can sort of help inform our thinking about cities today. And cities, you point out time and again that there are also places of, uh, of loneliness, uh, anonymity, isolation, uh, while at the same time being exciting places for collisions of ideas and, and, mm -hmm. and inventions. I wanted to sort of capture in this book this idea that cities are places of sensuality, enjoyment. You know, they're places where people come together, bring food, you know, bring entertainment, culture, all those kind of things make cities an enlivening place to be. I mean, this isn't simply a book about cities as, as cradles of power and inventiveness, that the city can bring people of different minds, different inclinations together um, to become places where you explore different things, like sexuality, for example, that's a big part of cities, to explore culture, to explore new ideas, whatever that might be, it is a great place where, where people can thrive. But it's also, it is, as you say, you know, a daunting place to a daunting environment in which to, to survive. So a lot of the book subsequently, especially in subsequent parts of the book, are about how we've kind of negotiated this, especially as they become larger. And when they become large, they become complex. They often come cut off compact cities through most of history. We're in quite close communion with their, with their countryside, their hinterlands. Suddenly your cities become bigger, you cut people off and they do, but you do become kind of lost in this kind of urban environment. I hope uh, those who are paying attention here, um realize your passion. It's astounding. It's not only in the way you speak about cities and their history and their evolution, but it's in the book. Now you read Thank the you. book and you're captured because the passion is there. It's great storytelling as well. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out about the first city in human history or just head to hecmedia.org. HEC Media. Recognized celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. 
Mid-America Emmys, Tellys, Natoas, Auroras, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We are here in the Central West End at Project Post Gallery at 4733 McPherson. And currently on view, we've got Stretch Marks, which is a group exhibition curated by Jennifer Sees. Uh, the theme of the exhibition is motherhood, but it explores the topics more generally of mark making and the creative process and the use of expressive mark making to explore the materiality and the experiences of having a mother and being a mother and the generative process of mark making in the creative experience. We have 23 artists that are on view and um, they are from our available works to acquire as well as some regional artists that we have consigned with. And there's a really great mix of materials and mediums. There's great examples of photography throughout the exhibition including some work by Julie Blackman. Her work really explores the domestic space there's some really great watercolor works, which are by a local artist named Natalie Baldion, and she is specifically exploring her experience as a mother, um, and especially the effects of that on the body. So the changes that take place, not all of them are pretty, but the material changes that happen to us as we progress through those stages of life. Uh, we've also got some really nice, more abstract works. So we've got everything from photography to drawing, printmaking and painting. And through all of them, you'll see either gestural mark making or you'll see some really nice carried motifs throughout the exhibition that include um, trees and roots, which really serves to underscore the idea of mother nature, um, the roots that tie us to our families, as well as um, the generative act of creation, both artistically and as a parent. And you'll also see a motif of hands throughout, which similarly ties to the ideas of reaching towards and reaching back in our history, um, reaching out for one another and making those connections. At Project Plus Gallery, our goals are really to explore the boundaries between different mediums, to celebrate all types of contemporary creative work, and really to support and empower artists uh, from every walk of life. We've been happy to bring in local artists to further our mission to really support the arts in our community while also exploring topics that are not always something that people talk about, especially in art. Stretch Marks is on view at Projects Plus Gallery through November 20th, and you can find more information about us at our website at projects-gallery.com. Behind the art of sound mixing, later on Spotlight. I have never seen it like this before, ever. The worst emergency blood shortage in years. We're in a global pandemic. We're also in a global blood shortage. Lives and habits changed in many ways for many reasons. We're seeing only a fraction of what we would see pre-COVID. So Mercy Blood Donor Services is mobile, getting out to draw blood. Go ahead and give me gentle squeezes every three to five seconds. It's not sitting off of the coast in a cargo ship. We really are fully dependent on people still coming in and donating blood. Mercy St. Louis is the only hospital in Missouri with its own mobile blood drives and blood supply. We're not 100% wholly dependent on any outside supplier to make sure that we have those life-saving products. Collections are for Mercy Hospitals in the St. Louis region to avoid what feels like a nightmare. The car accident that they transfused 300 units overnight, and I know what I've got on the calendar for the next two weeks, and it's like, 
we're not close. To stay stocked and ready for patients like John Ferretti with acute myeloid leukemia. With those low blood counts, can cause us to, it can cause us to get sick or it can cause us to bleed. His senior year of high school, treatments and quarantines to get through it all. Transfusions are very important to us to help keep us healthy. Sparing families from the painful feeling of hopelessness. It takes an hour and you're not just donating for my kid, you're donating for thousands of other people, whether it's an infant baby or a 90 year old man. You don't know what it's like to see your loved ones suffer because their blood counts are low. This is what it takes. I cannot get this from somewhere else. I can only collect it from a human at a blood drive for a patient upstairs. You can find the full story on our website, hecmedia.org. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place, hecmedia.org. We are in the teaching gallery here at the Mildred Lane Kemper Museum at Washington University. And the exhibit on display here is entitled Colonizing the Past, Constructing Race in Ancient Greece and Rome. And it's an exhibit that I curated in tandem with a course I'm teaching right now at WashU. This exhibit is about how artwork, both ancient and modern, has contributed to um, the image of antiquity that exists today um, that is highly racialized without necessarily being obviously racialized. And particularly the way that modern racial categorizations get attributed to the people of the past um, to whom they would basically be completely meaningless. The earliest objects in the exhibit go to possibly the 6th century BCE and the most recent object that we have in it is from the 1960s. The majority of the pieces in this exhibit come from the early modern period from the 16th and 17th centuries, particularly the Renaissance when there was a massive explosion of interest in the ancient world and especially in the cultures of Greece and Rome. And what we see are artists who are depicting the people of Greece and Rome to look like Europeans because these are European artists. And this is a period when ideas about race tied to skin color are in their infancy. They're starting to be developed, but they're not quite as universal as they are today. It's actually an open question exactly whether something that we would call race existed in ancient Greece or really in ancient Rome either. We know that these were societies that had xenophobia, that had oppression, that had imperialism. What we don't see is a particularly strong emphasis on things like skin tone as the kind of major categorizing factor for separating the people of the world. And in fact, there's certainly no attempt to group all people who share the same skin tone into one group. So the idea that white people exist or black people exist is just not something that we see in antiquity. As far as the actual racial makeup of either ancient Greece or Rome, it's a little bit hard to say. I think we can say safely that there were people who had a range of skin tones. These are societies that are part of the ancient Mediterranean, which is a complex, heterogeneous culture where there are just numbers of different people moving around and interacting with each other. And it's very likely that there's really not one skin tone that you would see in either of these civilizations. And that the way that they're categorizing people is not going to be based on that particular um, criterion. It's important for us to study the history of race in antiquity because it can be really helpful, I think, for understanding modern race to just see how different things can be. Often, even when we understand that race is a social construct, it's not something that's based in biology, it still feels somewhat inherent and innate to our world. And in reality, it's not. And it's easier to understand those differences when we have a stark comparison to make. And then also, I think it's important to study what people actually thought in the ancient world because for most of the history of scholarship on the ancient world, you have scholars imputing their own racial biases into their interpretations of the ancient world. And for us who are now 
trying to work against that and get past that, we need to understand what those biases are and how they're shaping their interpretation of the information that was available to them. Colonizing the past, constructing race in ancient Greece and Rome is open to the public and will be on display until December 27th. For more information, you can visit the Kemper's website. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Boss books the band, the marketing people figure out how to sell it, and my job is to put all those pieces together so when an audience member walks in the room to see their favorite band, they have the best experience that they can have without any understanding or concern about what it takes to put all that together. The reality of most of it is you've got to have the technical skills on all the equipment, that's kind of a given. The real skill is the diplomacy on everything from talking to my own crew, talking to the artist. A majority of the time I end up mixing the band, which means the band is on stage, everybody sees microphones on everything. My job is to balance all that sound. The band makes the sound they make on the stage. My job is to balance all that into the venue so you can have the, the experience that you expect to have. As the sound guy, as an audio engineer, I have to understand balance. I have to understand the physics of the room. So my job is to make that balance fit the room the way you would expect to hear it on a record or if you're sitting home watching it on TV. You have to understand how different voices react, male voices, female voices. You have to understand the, the tonal range of each instrument so that, you know, you know, say they're like, all the instruments are like this at first. My job is to make it go like that and become one unit so it, it's not you don't hear six instruments you hear one song uh, all the microphones connect to the back of my console and then they all translate to my faders so i've got control so you know say this is my voice and these are my drums and so i use all this to to set up what the balance is going to be these are my faders some of them were wired a little weird um, so up is loud, down is off. Uh, but then I also have complete control over uh, equalization, which is the tone. So I can change, say you've got an instrument that pretty much sounds great, but there's one tonality that's not quite right. I can adjust that. Um, so that's the manipulation part. So if your voice needs to be louder than the band, I can turn you up. If it needs a little bit more clarity, I can add a little bit more high frequencies to it. The sound guy can't make a bad band sound much better, but you can definitely screw up a great band by doing it wrong. Our job is to serve you to the best of our ability without you knowing that we ever had a fingerprint on any of it. So if we do our job right, nobody knows we exist. And now from the stage of the Sheldon Concert Hall, Marquise Knox. Crying, bye bye babe, bye bye baby, bye bye. And bye, and bye. Baby, won't you by and by? Oh, and I ain't doing nothing. A baby reaping by and by. Well, I'm going away. And I won't be back to fall. I'm going. We Lord, babe, I won't be back to fall. And if I find my good girl, babe, I won't be back at all. Then 
me a good book tell you reap just what you sow the good book tell you baby reap just what you sow but I ain't doing nothing baby reaping by and by Well, I'm going away, and I won't be back no more. I'm going away, Lord, babe, I won't be back no more. And if I find my good God, babe, I won't be back at all. by and by Didn't that good book tell you reap just what you sow That good book tell you baby reap just what you sow But I ain't doing nothing Baby by and by Well, I'm going away I won't be back to fall I'm going away, Lord Babe, I won't be back to fall And if I find my good girl Babe, I won't be back it all when it good book tell you reap just what you sow the good book tell you baby reap just what you sow but I ain't doing nothing baby by and by Next week, celebrate Thanksgiving with the owner of restaurant Didi Mao Vietnamese. Plus, you'll meet the pickle lady who serves tasty pickles with an attitude. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.